Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Footballing Weekly at Yahoo with me, author and Yahoo columnist Neil Humphreys and him over there. Hi, I'm uh, Han Kyung from Yahoo as well and this is our special guest for our first episode. We have footballita Ash Hashim. Hello. Ash, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself first? Yeah, firstly, thank you so much, Neil and Hang Kyung, for having me here on your first ever podcast. It's an honor. Um, well, I mean, just to answer, I'm Ash from Footballita, the female football voice. It's the tagline that we call ourselves. I'm a journalist, a presenter, like a content creator, and also a FIFA players agent. So that means I negotiate deals for players in Singapore and also around parts of Asia to move them around clubs. So yeah, but that doesn't mean you can DM me, okay? Because I I do on a case to case basis. I'm, I'm I'm feeling a bit humble now, don't you? I'm a bit, a bit <laughs> yeah, inadequate. Yeah. No, come on, this guy. Is like an award-winning author a bit of several books. So, yeah. Well, that's just the first episode. That's just the first episode. Uh, we'll just tell you a little bit about why Hank Kyung and I came up with this. Um, I've known the guy for 20 plus years. Wow. Too long. Um, too long. Far too long. I've tried to dump this guy for years. Yes. He hangs yeah, on to hangs me. On. Between uh, us, we've got 40 on. years, 40, 40 years yeah. of football journalism oh. experience. Some of it was relevant. Useful. Most of it is. <laughs> Most of it is completely yeah, irrelevant. Irrelevant. <laughs> but between us, we've got 40 years, so we thought, let's do a podcast. We've been wanting to do it now for many, many years, but we hope the difference with this podcast will be that it will be driven by you and yep. your questions and comments every week that you'll send into the show. So where can you find us? You can find us at Spotify, of course. Uh, you can also find us at... Uh, uh, our YouTube channel, Yahoo Southeast Asia, our Facebook channels, Yahoo Singapore, Yahoo Malaysia. You can find us at Twitter, Yahoo SG, at Yahoo SG or Yahoo underscore MY. Just, type Yahoo. Just, yeah, type, Yahoo. Just type Yahoo. 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 Just type Yahoo. Yahoo. Just type Yahoo. 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 You'll find uh, us. We might even put it up on TikTok. And if it's TikTok, it's Southeast Asia. Yahoo Southeast Asia. Yeah, steady. Nice. steady. Yeah, yeah. All right, so getting into the season. We're one week away from the first game of the season. So we're going to start with our season preview. Two horse race. Yes or no? <laughs> I wrote a column this week for Yahoo Singapore, Yahoo Southeast Asia. And I believe that there will be, hopefully, a two horse race. Han Kyung, what do you think? Yeah, I think, um, I think Man City... As good as they are, they are in transition. Um, obviously, they brought in a very good, rep, very good, reputable striker called Erling Haaland. But as you have seen in the Community Shield, he still needs some time to get used to the team. Mm. Yeah. So, when, as he gets used to the team, there might be some, some, some. There may be a window for yes. for teams like Liverpool, Spurs, even Chelsea or Arsenal, maybe just to keep. The race tight. Yeah. And then if you keep the race tight a bit, maybe by by Christmas, maybe there will be a very it will be it might eventually end up being a two horse race. Yeah. But I think this season might be a bit more competitive. What do you think? What was that stat that I saw, Neil? I think Haaland had not seven touches on the ball or something for the first let, game. And, let me enlighten you. And it was you. a very interesting stat I have to add. I mean, for, for someone who obviously has a lot of promise and he was doing very well in Borussia Dortmund and the Bundesliga. But I think there's a lot of pressure, including the fact that he's got that tie to Man City. His father used to play for Man City, mm. wasn't he, at yeah. that point? So to come onto his first game and everyone expecting him to score, you know, under all that pressure, I think, I always believe in the evil eye and all that pressure. So I think you got to give him a, a couple of weeks to set, settle into the Premier League. And I think, you know, there's still a long way to go. I did a poll on my Instagram, a lot of people, to choose between Darwin Nunes and, and Haaland. And I would say at least 46% of the people still were with Haaland despite that, you know, mediocre performance. No, but, you know. I don't want him to settle in. I want him to have a nightmare <laughs> for the first month. In the game, in the Community Shield, he had 16 touches. 16 touches. Pep Guardiola had more touches on the touchline, <laughs> putting the ball back. He had seven passes, no headers won, no dribbles, and no interceptions. And he played, like I said in the column, I mean, he played like a zombie extra. You know, like <laughs> he was wandering into this unfamiliar environment. Territory. You know, sort of Frankenstein-esque looking for some fresh blood. And, and all he had to do, or all the Liverpool mm. defenders had to do, like you do with a zombie, is just walk very slowly <laughs> away from him. That there was better. no running involved. He was hopeless. And it was wonderful. Why? Because if you look, take it upside down, conversely, if he hit the ground running first week, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> because Manchester City without Haaland 
still wins four titles out of five, right? Manchester City with Haaland, who is going to become the best striker in the world, barring injury and a spectacular loss of form. That I have no doubt. He's going to become the best striker in the world. But the good news for Liverpool and anyone who wants to see anything <laughs> other than a one-horse, dull, tedious procession is that Pep Guardiola is starting something brand new. Mm. That I find exciting. He doesn't. He probably hates it. But I find it genuinely exciting because for the first time in the Pep Guardiola era, he isn't sure. He's brought in a, a conventional number nine type. You saw in the Community Shield, he's making runs, the balls weren't coming. Yep. Kevin De Bruyne wasn't finding him. He will in time. They just don't play that way. It's lots of incisive passes, left flank, right flank, triangles, very nifty, very fast. He looks like a battering ram amongst <laughs> ballerinas. And that's great. That's great because the longer it yeah. takes Manchester City to adapt to this new system, the better chance it gives Liverpool, Arsenal, Tottenham, Chelsea to make it a competitive race. And it brings me to my next point. Since you mentioned Haaland, um, you do remember that they used to have Gabriel Jesus playing for them. And Gabriel is doing really well at Arsenal. He's been scoring, Fantastic. I think, five goals in six games, which is the irony, right? Yeah. So it does take time, I think, for Haaland to settle in to the league. Um, but like you said, I think if he started like quickly, he might burn out. Maybe he's not used to the pace of the Premier League as compared to the Bundesliga. As we he all wasn't know. bought for the league. Mm. Yeah. Pure and simple. He was bought for the Champions League. Uh, he has cool. to win the Champions League. You know, when a city-state owns the football club, <laughs> they did not buy Manchester City to win Premier League titles. They didn't. They bought Manchester City as a global soft power PR exercise PR. to, you know, create peace, love and joy around the world <laughs> for all things Manchester City. And to do that, number one priority Champions League. He was there bought to true. win That's the true. Champions League. And I tell you, I, th I think one one thing I really like about Pep Guardiola, he's like he's a total genius in in management, in tactician, but he always have one fatal flaw. Hmm. And his fatal flaw is he can't he just doesn't know how to use an out and out striker. No. Aguero, <laughs> he like he was planning to Correct. dump him before he uh, had a change of heart. Gabriel Jesus, Correct. same thing. Raheem Sterling one, wanted to play him as an outstriker, couldn't do it. And now they can get a really a pure striker like Haaland. And I think, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that he just doesn't figure it out for as long as oh, possible. Of course, yeah, as a Liverpool fan. <laughs> well, you remember, you remember yeah. that um, Guardiola had one of the best strikers of a generation in Abramovic, Ibrahimovic, yeah. sorry, and uh, Zlatan. And he couldn't work it. Yeah, he couldn't Arsenal. work it. Zlatan wouldn't adapt to Guardiola's, what did he call it? Little boys playground yeah, passing. The Ferrari time. The thing. Ferrari time, yeah. right? And and Guardiola wouldn't adapt to his <laughs> style of play. Something has to give. Look, as I said, Haaland was not signed to score three or four goals against the likes of Leeds or whatever. He was signed to put away the chances that they missed against Real Madrid. Yep. That's why he was bought. That's fantastic news for Liverpool. Why? Because Nunes, hand in glove. Hand in glove, perfect signing. Yeah. What what uh, Jurgen Klopp does very well, he buys specific players to fit to a specific system. Diaz slotted slotted in so seamlessly, yep. didn't even notice. It'll be exactly the same with Nunes. So you can rotate Nunes. Uh, who else we got up there? Jota, Jota Salah. Diaz, Salah, Firmino, and it will be pretty effortless. Yep. If they can get a head start on Manchester City as Haaland settles. Great news for the Premier League. And if you factor in Spurs and Arsenal, Chelsea, it could be open. So what do you think about the top four? So I was just just so you guys know that during the preseason when Liverpool were in town, so I had the chance to interview and speak to Liverpool's nutritionist, uh, Mona Nemer. Mona, yeah. So Mona is known. Oh, no, he's, oh Mona, like yeah, your first like name Mona. term for the guy. Oh, yeah, Mona. <laughs> so I know Mona, the club best. Yeah, we got a muck on every Tuesday. Yes. Me and Mona, the nutritionist <laughs> at Liverpool. We need the right nutrition to we got for slim the, me down. Yeah, the Nazi Lemak burger or yeah. whatever there it's called. Laksana. Laksana. Laksana, yeah, Laksana, yeah, Laksana, 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 Laksana burger. burger, yeah. 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 So Mona. Mona. So Mona wrote a book, I think mm. maybe you know, it's called The Taste of Liverpool and, and Jurgen Klopp said in the foreword that she was the best signing Liverpool ever made. Mm. And I when, I when I read the book, there were a couple of things that really stood up for me. It's not just the planning of the meals, it's just the, the way she treats the players as well. You know, during COVID, she was able to, you know, help them through that mental state. And I think Liverpool's mental state was the one that really helped them. They, they didn't win the quadruple, but it was just little things, you know, that, that the club did for them that really helped the players to get 
to peak performance, which is so important in professional football, to be equipped mentally as well as physically. And that's why I think they're going to do really well in the upcoming season because of people like Mona at the club. Yeah. You know, who really push them. And, 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 and therefore, I think Liverpool have a good chance to win the title, actually. I wouldn't say that they are going to be, you know, outright Champions League winners, but I think the Premier League is definitely a good shot for them this yeah. season. Speaking so. of mental strength, the lunatic that is Antonio Conte <laughs> <laughs> is just fabulous because Fan- that pre-season fantastic. footage oh. of Harry Kane throwing up, you know, <laughs> yeah. doing this, yeah. like, this oh. full-throated kind of Jackson Pollock, you know, <laughs> all, all over the turf. And then it was a sudden Min, Min, right, yeah. collapsing in front of his own fans, yeah. right? Brilliant. I love it. It will combust. It will destroy. It will implode. It always does. But for the next season or two, they are going to be dangerous. I think their signings are fantastic. Um, I think Conte's drilled them well. I wrote a piece for Yahoo Singapore. I think this is going to be, I hope it's going to be Sun Hong Ming's uh, season. Yeah. I think he still hasn't fully peaked yet. What a season. If Sun and because they are very similar, yeah. workaholics, industrious, automatons. You know, Sun Hong Ming is a Conte kind of player yep. all day long. All and day I actually long. think they are the two key people at Spurs more than Harry Kane and it was a pity as well because Young um Song was not even nominated for player of the season uh, oh, yeah, last right. uh, last season that was a travesty huge, yeah it was a travesty mm. I really thought wow he had a fantastic season very consistent and of course as Asians we are very proud of, of him representing us on, on the on that stage so mm. yeah and it it's was, because he's Asian yeah. I said it in the column it's because he's Asian <laughs> he's understated he underplays his talent he he, he constantly yeah. deflects compliments away to his yeah. teammates he's got that filial piety yeah. and, you know <laughs> mindset yeah. that he respects his elders and he respects his coaches and his managers and he goes back diligently and does his national service without complaint yeah. a South Korea he is, he is the perfect poster boy for the Asian boy next door yeah. you know loyal to filial piety loyal <laughs> to his elders loyal to his fans yeah. and it's that reason I think that even now he's slightly underrated oh yeah yeah you know yeah so I totally agree I think I think Man City Liverpool and Spurs are going to be in the top Right, give us your top, top four, four then. Give us your top four. So, so now you're left with one spot, and it's between Chelsea, Arsenal, and Man U. Mm. And I think it could be Ma- it could be Arsenal who take that one. You nearly said Man U then. No, I nearly no, fell no, my no, chair. No, no, you no, nearly said Man U. I say I say Arsenal, but Man U I think will improve, but not to the extent that it will get into the top four. But I think Arsenal have made some great signings this this off season. Gabriel Jesus. I think he'll be unshackled finally. Yeah. Mm. And then I think he'll work very well under Mikel Arteta. And then uh, you have uh, Fabio Vieira. Um, and then you have uh, Zinchenko. Yes, yes signing. signed uh, good as signing. Well, yeah. uh, great, great, great from the left side. So I think in the preseason gone gone pretty well. Although obviously, it's a bit inconsequential. But I think... I, I still think Arsenal might need uh, more backup in the defence. Mm. Yeah. The defence is a bit soft. But I think they they could be good enough for fourth place because I think Chelsea have problems, which we'll, we'll explain later. And Man, Man United won't improve that much. Okay. Ah, Ash, Ten top Hag. four. You know, we're just like, I was just reading out about Ten Hag recently and, and, and all the things he was doing in training with the younger players. I actually do think that Man U have a bit of a chance this coming season because of Ten Hag himself as a coach and, and what he's trying to imply in the young players. This but is you just win. trying to appease the Manchester no, United fan base no. across Southeast Asia. I, I you see all the comments coming in. I think the it's something different We like though. Ash. We don't like Hank Kyo. We don't like <laughs> Neil. But we love Ash. She says I'm they're going to finish in the top four. No, I'm going to go with Liverpool, Man City, Man U and I just want a, a bit of an outside team. You know, I really like how West Ham was in the top four last season for some Whoa. reason. So, you know, I like a surprise in the league, guys. So, you know, who knows? It might be West Ham. <laughs> it's not going to be West Ham. Singapore's, know, Singapore's know. only West Ham fan is the thing. Yeah, like well, <laughs> sort of. Okay, my top four. And this is more out of hope than expectation. Yeah. Liverpool. I'm going to go with Liverpool. My heart says Liverpool. Manchester City, Tottenham, Arsenal. Those are the top four. But what do you think? Let us know what you think. Send in your top four predictions for next season and any questions you might have about the top four or the title race do you think it'll be a two horse race who's your pick let us know at tell us Yahoo Southeast Asia YouTube Yahoo Singapore Yahoo Malaysia Facebook we'll have it memorised by the end of the show we will have it memorised (laughs) okay right 
Topic two. Let's get to topic two. Previews, reviews of the preseason, the transfers, best transfers, worst transfers. There's only one place to start this. The only place to start this <laughs> is the man, the legend, the myth, the tan colossus himself, <laughs> the bronzed, the bronzed icon of Portugal, Cristiano Ronaldo. What do we think? Oh dear. Uh, oh dear. You're an agent. Yeah, I'm a yeah, licensed like... FIFA agent. <laughs> Pretending for a second you're his agent. If you are his agent, you're not sitting here. But if you are his agent, <laughs> what are you doing with Ronaldo? So I had the pleasure of actually meeting Jorge Mendes in uh, Dubai for oh, Globe Soccer wow. Awards. See, this is why this is the this caliber is, of the show. <laughs> no, this is the caliber. No, no. The name no, dropping. No, the name no, dropping. No, no, I had to because I didn't expect he would actually be nice. I thought he was going to be one of those arrogant mm. beats, you know, that you don't really. Um, sort of would be personable mm. so yeah I spoke to him a little bit and he was saying oh I have a very good friend in Singapore and I said who is it Peter Lim is his mm -hmm. name I was like of yeah course. of course yeah so then he talks about it but I'm um, going back to Ronaldo I think this whole situation was really something someone like Jorge would probably not expect someone of, of, of Ronaldo's caliber you know you, you would expect even though it's at his age at 37 years old you would think clubs would be knocking on his door you know he would be you know the number one on their target list but I think word has gotten out, you know, Neil, about what's been happening at Man United, you know, how mm. he's a player that requires, you know, a certain type of, of I would say, a, a character or dressing room to, I, I guess, like, you know, collate around him, you know. So it has to work around him. And, and I think that doesn't bode well, well for a team game. So, for example, Man U don't want to keep him because they just don't think that he, he disrupts the nature of the dressing room, for example. Because he's that kind of player that, wants it all to be about himself, right? Yeah. Me, 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 me. So it's... Which has been a very successful mindset for, for him himself. for 20 years, you know. Yeah, but then we... Football's changing, right? And of course, yeah. as an agent, um, I think Jorge is knocking on every single club's door from Atletico Madrid to Chelsea. And he even go back to Real Madrid to so Bayern and every back single... Back to his own to his sporting club. listeners. Nobody yeah. wants him. The thing that's Nobody the, wants him. Even Atletico recently at their preseason training, um, I think there were a couple of fans holding up banners yeah. saying, we do not want Ronaldo yeah. explicitly. And Which so is extraordinary, right? Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. It's actually yeah. extraordinary. It's amazing for, yeah. I mean, what I, do you think? What do you think? I, I mean, I, I personally, I prefer Messi to Ronaldo, but... Mm. I, I do not hate him. I think he's a wonderful player. Same, same. He's a spectacular player and, and, and as, as usual. But I think the times have passed him mm. as well as Messi, mm. both of them. It's, it's sad. They are, they, are the, they are at the end of their careers and I, I don't think they deserve to go out that way. Like yeah. nobody wants him. Yeah. But they do have to bring themselves a bit lower. Ronaldo still wants to get that Champions League record off Lionel yeah. Messi. Yeah. So, so I think... I think if he accepts that uh, maybe I shouldn't go for this, I just want to maybe go back to my old club and just help them out. Maybe, he, maybe if he yeah. feels this Play way, coach. Sporting Lisbon might get him back. Mm. But now he wants Champions League record. I, I, I don't know which Champions League team who wants to win the Champions League wants to get him mm. because it's tough, yeah. yeah. But there I saw... Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah. There was an interesting quote from the Bayern Munich uh, CEO, Oliver mm. Kahn, obviously. We all know Oliver Kahn. He did say that the reason why Bayern didn't want Ronaldo was because he didn't fit into the culture of the club. Mm. Which I think it's really interesting. Like, he actually said it. Some of the other clubs didn't want to explicitly say, but Kahn went on record to say that. So that says a lot when someone's willing to talk about why they don't want to bring a player in. I think, yeah, it doesn't vote very well for Ronaldo. Maybe he can come to Asia, I don't know. But what was interesting oh, to me GDP. before... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, Peter Lim's got, yeah, a, lot Peter of, Lim's got a lot of contacts in his condom. A lot of contacts yeah. in Johor. Um, what was interesting to me before we recorded this, I had a look at some of the Manchester United forums in Singapore, Southeast Asia. Not a lot of support for Ronaldo. I was, I was quite surprised because this stereotype that, you know, fickle, you know, jaundiced, one-sided, blinkered supporters. No, it was quite balanced objective analysis saying this man clearly does not want to be here and even if he did he's going to be 38 soon he doesn't fit into our model or, or the fast pressing game that Ten Hag wants yeah. so he doesn't fit he's being selfish and the interesting thing to me Han Kyung he's slightly a victim of his own success meaning that because sports science and nutrition and diet and he's unbelievable, incomparable will of strength, right? He should have retired years ago. But because he's still able to play at a certain level, not quite elite level, 
he's not quite willing to bow out. And because yeah. there are these superpowers, Middle Eastern superpowers, <laughs> that can still pay huge sums of money, yep. he's not willing to give it up. Whereas just a few years ago, even just a few years ago, you know, a, a David Beckham or, or an Alan Shearer or going back a little bit further than that, Zinedine Zidane, someone like that, Figo, they'd reached sort of mid-30s and that was it. They were done. Yeah. They was done. But while there are these global superpowers who are willing to parade Ronaldo like some sort of trinket, like some sort of Hollywood <laughs> actor on their shoulder, you know, like you can buy them, like you can buy Paris Hilton for a, for a night at a disco, you can buy Ronaldo for a season at your club, yeah. you know, he's becoming the Paris Hilton of world <laughs> no, football. Paris Hilton. And that's very sad because he's living off past glories. And you do reach a point when you think, Ronaldo, I love you. I think your work ethic is second to none. How much do you need? How much do you want? Go to America. Play in yeah. America. You take a pay cut. Go to Australia. Go to Asia. You know, go for Peter Lim. Go to JDT. Go somewhere. <laughs> go to but don't keep chasing around millions and millions and millions of dollars playing for a team yeah. that does not want you. That I mean, what do you think? So I heard the figure you were talking about, the Saudis were offering him 300 million a year, which is ridiculous money. And I know it's he, obscene money. Yeah, it's Let's obscene get it right. Money. It is obscene money. Yeah. Right? So that's that's what they're talking about, that range. But you know, it's more of, of what he wants to achieve as a as a player, like you said, Champions League and mm. perhaps his final World Cup as well this year. So where will be the best fit for him to go? It really remains to be seen, actually. Like I think the money is great, but I mean Newcastle. How yeah. gone? Newcastle. No, I want him at Hull Gun. <laughs> I want him at Hull Gun, man. Hull I, want him, I want him down at the Hull Gun Stadium. <laughs> yes. I, want him, I want him with the Hull Gun Hoolies. My local side, my cuckies are down there at the Hull Gun Stadium. I go watch them. Let's get Ronaldo down to Hull Gun. If money's no object, let's get him down to Hull Gun. Hull Gun for me. You heard it here first. Ronaldo for Hull Gun. All right, so Ronaldo, I think this will drag on for another week or two. Let's look at the other signings. Who's been the best signings or, the, or what you think will be the most successful signings so far? Well, I think, um, actually, I think Habro is Jesus. Yeah, really I agree. Yeah. I, that's yeah. my one. You've picked my yeah, one. Yeah. We've Same. got to stop Same. agreeing yeah. or this podcast yeah, will go nowhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's yeah. start okay, arguing. Okay, let, me, let me put Raheem Sterling. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, stick with oh, Jesus. Go on. Okay, I think, I think Arsenal have needed an out and out striker for, for quite a while now. Aubameyang didn't work out. He had he had issues with with Arteta maybe. So it, and Lacazette, well, good Neither good at times, but that, very yeah. inconsistent. Mm. So now, I think with Jesus, Bukayo Saka, and Odegaard behind behind those two, I think it's a very um, impressive uh, front line for Arsenal. Their their defense is still suspect, like I said before. But I think they've they've solved that that kind of that, that's the front line for the near future, and have. And Jesus is like, wow, I'm finally gone from Guardiola. It's like playing like, you know, how like, I want, like yeah. you got the chains released like that. <laughs> oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to score, score like, man, I'm going to just stay in the, the penalty box and don't come and pass around me. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so I think, I think he'll, he'll be like a very, very, very good striker who has already a lot of Premier League experience. And I think he'll work out very well for Arteta. I think that's a great signing. Yeah. And he throw yeah. in uh, Zinchenko. Yeah. Both yeah. players haven't reached their peak yet. I mean, I, I look, you know, Jesus is only 25. He's yeah, been around for a long like time. He's been, yeah. for he's been so. six seasons already. With, yeah. I think that's a slight yeah. gamble for Manchester City. Raheem Sterling going to Chelsea. There is the potential for him to link up on the left flank with yep. Ben Chilwell, who's about to return. But there's always, I, I can't put my finger on it, but there's, it's not a question mark. It, it's almost a caveat with Raheem Sterling. Yeah. You know, if there's a, a chance in the 90th minute of a Champions League game, do you want it to fall to Raheem Sterling? <laughs> Hand on heart. I love Sterling. Yeah, yeah. I love what he does outside yeah. of the game. I love what he's done for the, you know, the black representation and community in the UK. It's fantastic. I love everything he does and says, like I do with Marcus Rashford. Yeah. <laughs> but both of them, last minute, 90th minute, who yeah. do you want the chance to fall to? Honestly, I'd rather Jesus. I'd rather <laughs> go with Jesus. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so I all agree Jesus is the best signing. I, I think Nunes as well for okay. me. I mean, initially I had my doubts about mm. him actually in the preseason. I thought he was like rubbish, but I love players who prove people wrong. Collectively, I'll just say Tottenham, 
three signings. Perisic is a great signing yeah. as a squad player. Mm. To be able to have Richarlison mm -hmm. on the bench is extraordinary. Yeah. To come on. And Basuma is a fantastic signing. Fantastic. It's their first sort of combative midfielder, I think, since Dembele left. Yep. So, and that's what they missed. So with Basuma in midfield, Perisic possibly on the flanks, Richarlison on the bench. Great squad, great yeah. squad. But what do you think? Who are the best signings? Who's going to be the hits or misses of the season? Let us know. Hank Kyung, have you got it memorised yet? What are the platforms? <laughs> YouTube, Very Yahoo good. Southeast Asia. Facebook, Yahoo Singapore, Yahoo Malaysia. And if you want to go to TikTok, at Yahoo SG <laughs> or at Yahoo uh, underscore MY. Yeah. By Jovi's got it. By Jovi's got it. Right. I'll, 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 I'll say it in my sleep this morning. Yeah, he will. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, let's, what I wanted to do, one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast with my old friend, Han Kyung, 40 years football wow. experience, I football media experience. Did I mention that? Almost all of Have it was useless. Have you guys been to World Cups together? Like, no, we don't like each other. Yeah, we don't. No. Yeah. We so just you guys don't go for drinks after games. Oh, I no. taught him everything yeah. he knows. Oh, really? I taught him everything he knows. Wow. I did. I did. I did. It, took, <laughs> it took five minutes. It took five minutes. <laughs> But I, the, one of the reasons we did this podcast uh, is because I wanted to have a focus on regional football, Southeast Asian football, in some cases, Singapore football. Perfect timing this week to have you on the show where, what are we, 48 hours after the Lionesses won the Euro Championships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What has that got to do with Asian football? Well, I would argue everything <laughs> because first things first, couple of stats, Ash, before we get you to talk about women's football in the region, right? 17 million people in the UK watch the final. The biggest TV event in the UK this year, in the era of Stranger Things and all the other TV shows, the number one watch thing in the UK this year was the Lionesses final. Number two, 87,192 fans turned up at Wembley Stadium, which is the highest capacity crowd ever, ever in any European final, men or women. Something has happened. And before people say, ah, well, you know, we just back winners. I was in England when the Euro started, when no one had any idea how England would do. Packed crowds, great atmosphere, good coverage, good sponsorship, right across the board. So it's not just, you know, bandwagon jumpers. Yeah. This has been building for some time. Clearly now, women's football, here to stay in Europe, North America, we already know about, Australia. Ash, Asia, what's happening? Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I was watching the Lionesses as well. And the other thing to note, it was that the men's Euro final had only 62,000 people because of COVID. But it is a marked difference in yeah, attendance. Yeah, because they were too busy getting drunk and taking <laughs> drugs and sticking flares up their bottoms. So that's the thing. The difference was that <sighs> there wasn't any of that, you know, in Precisely. the women's game. You know, the family stayed. Wonderful. They felt Wonderful. good, you know, going to Wembley, taking the trains. You know, the vibe is just different. I had the chance to go to the Women's World Cup as well in France. Three years ago, I believe in 2019, it was like the most random game, Canada and Sweden. But you could see, you could sense the vibes, you know, in the stadium. I went as a spectator, so it wasn't media, but it was so much fun. And, you know, you could really feel the positivity in the atmosphere, but it really bodes well for women's football. Because, I mean, girls for the first time are watching games and going, hey, one day I could be, you know, like um, one of the players that could be, you know, Chloe Kelly, perhaps, you know, mm. the, the the clutch player who scored the, go the goal, who used to take the bus to Wembley, by the way. That was a story, you know. And these are all inspiring figures for not just the England Lionesses, but the Singapore Lionesses as well, you know, who I'm really okay. proud of, yeah. Very good. Lots of rah-rah, slightly yeah. diplomatic, right? Yeah. I spoke to a coach who I'm not going to name, who I spoke to just before coming on air, a form, no, I won't be too specific, but a, a coach who works with one of the women's teams in Singapore, and he said, I'm not going to give you my honest opinion on the record. So, Ash, where are we? Are we genuinely progressing? Is the women's game taking off in Singapore? Well, I have to be very honest. It's only in recent years or even a recent year or so that people have started to actually care about women's football. Um, before this, of course, we've had our teams. And women's football, to be honest, hasn't been on the, you know you know, get, get, gotten a lot of publicity because of COVID, number one. So the women's tournament has been sort of uh, put on the back burner. So women have not gotten the chance to play for the past two years. So this year, finally, the Deloitte Women's Premier League is back. So, I mean, there's been investment in some mm. sense, support from the FA as well. I have to add, it's because FIFA has been really, you know, I would say, 
uh, supportive. There's a COVID-19 Women's Fund as well. So there is like a push for us to do a bit more women's football. And because of this, I think that's why we have the Deloitte Women's Premier League and a lot more coverage and a lot more interest. But I, I agree a lot, a lot more needs to be done on the grassroots front. Even in terms of the salaries that the women earn, we have a long way to go. I know that what's happening on the ground, um, it's not all perfect, but at least we are better than we were like four or five years ago and it's a lot to ask, yeah. yeah. So you did, a, you, you did a weekly show, you are doing a weekly yeah. show on the, Premier, the Women's Premier League and then you're speaking to all the players. Yes. So speaking to all the players, what, 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 what is the sense you get from the players themselves? Um, well, I have to admit that, thanks for the question, by the way, Han Kyung, is that everyone's happy that we have a professional women's league. But of course, there are eight teams in the league and not ev not all the teams mm. are getting the same, um, you know, support that they would like. Of course, we, can, we know some teams are getting better, you know, access or even better, I don't know, like, what do you call it? Like, um, opportunities and, and, and resources as well, um, as, as opposed to other teams. So, there is still that... I would say that gap. But within, you know, the next couple of years, I hope that that gap, you know, will close and, and the girls start to feel like they are part of something bigger where they don't have to work and also play football. Because I, I think that it needs to be sustainable because the men are able to live on a livable wage, but the women have to work and do an additional thing. So football becomes like an afterthought, like a hobby. Yeah. So I, I work on the weekdays and I train on the weekends and I do it because I love football. But no, we need to be, the women deserve to be paid, you know. Um, yes, a livable course. wage for, for playing football, yeah. Well, I'm looking at Han Kyong's marvellous statistics here and he tells me that the Philippines and Vietnam yes. are entering the Women's World Cup, which yes. is fantastic for the region. I'm putting you on the spot. How far are we from Singapore doing the same? Because I would argue, here's a, here's a controversial point, I would argue there's more chance of the Singapore women getting the World Cup than there is the Singapore men, surely. Yeah, well, Neil, I have to agree with you on that. Sorry if any of the national team boys are watching this because I know that they watch my stuff. But the women's team, <laughs> the women's team, um, I did some statistics as well. I did a video recently and there were some um, stats that actually said we are actually ranked eight in ASEAN, um, in the ASEAN uh, women's football and in the recent AFF Champions League as well. AFF Women's Championships, we played against teams like Thailand, Indonesia. We are slightly higher than Malaysia and Indonesia at the moment and above us is Philippines and Thailand. So, we lost, yes. We lost badly to them though. We lost badly. There is a huge gap there yeah. but it is doable I think in the next two or three years. We need to play, keep on playing teams like this to know how to improve but I think we're getting there. I have a lot of confidence. We have the right players and, and I think, yeah, I think it's, it's possible actually, yeah. Well, I hope so. I'm healthily cynical because we're talking about the future and I want to finish by talking a little bit about the past. <laughs> which is Fandi Ahmad. We all know Fandi. He's a hero of mine. I make no secret of this. I'll get your take on it. But recently, just last week actually, he joined uh, Pahang as their technical advisor in the Malaysian Super League. Now look, I don't know the reasons why. I mean, there could, it could be financial. It could be all kinds of lifestyle choices. Maybe he was offered something here that wasn't agreeable to him. Who knows? But here's the thing I wanted to say. I read the Malaysian coverage of Fandi going to Pahang, right? It's like a homecoming. It's like our boys coming home. He used to play for Pahang and he played in KO and he was a big success in the Malaysia Cup. Yeah. Our boys coming home. Why is he not here? Why is why do we not revere our sporting icons? We don't have that many in the same way we revere our business leaders and our political leaders. I mean, we're building Founders Memorial, right? And that's yeah. great. Fantastic. Where's our statue to Fandi? Where is our statue to Fandi Ahmad outside the Sports Hub? The Sports Hub has just been taken back by the government. <laughs> yeah. Item number one, build a statue to Singapore's famous footballing son outside the stadium. For whatever reason, we still do not treat our football and sporting legends with the kind of reverence that other countries do. Yep. Why do we not treat Fandi the same way that Germany treats Franz Beckenbauer or Portugal treats Eusebio or Brazil treats Pele yep. or Argentina treated Diego Mar Maradona Mar before he passed away? There is a generation of kids growing up now who do not know who Fandi Ahmad is. And they'll say, oh, but that's because he's old. Bobby Moore, World Cup winning captain hey. of England 1966, 
My nephew knows who Bobby Moore is. Bobby Moore's been dead for nearly 20 years, but my nephew, who's 10 years old, knows who Bobby Moore is because he's a World Cup winning captain with England. Every Singaporean should know Fandi. We should revere him, adore him. There's only one. We yeah. should build statues to him. He should be ambassadors for everything. Sports ambassador, football <laughs> ambassador, health ambassador, whatever. But we should champion our sporting icons at home. We don't have many. So job number one, build the statue outside <laughs> the sports hub. I'll be there at the unveiling. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? For sure. No, I think I think that's that's true. Um, but in general, I think it's just the culture here and most... I don't want to you know, offend anyone, but I think Singaporeans in general tend to be very jaded when it comes to Singapore football. So there's a lot of judgment there and going, ah, he's a has-been, for example. But the respect needs to be there. And now, of course, he has his sons playing for us. And I'm, you know, I'm very proud, really proud of what Fundy has achieved as well. I mean, many of my friends, media friends in Malaysia always say, hey, you know, the Fundy boys are doing well. Their dad used to be a legend. So it's something that we can be proud of, actually. But with about the statue, I'm not sure if we're going to see that anytime soon because it's just not in our culture. To do that, I, I don't know. It's just a Singaporean thing. And it's sad, you know, it's it's sad, yeah. I mean, before before they put up the sports hub, maybe at, in the start of that last decade, I did write a column saying that you should put all the Malaysian Cup, the gallery. Yeah, really? You should. I, yeah, 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 put a statue, or at the very least, a gallery to, to commemorate. They, they made the old national stadium what it was. Yeah, I and love that, the old stadium. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you build a new one over the old stadium, have it memorable, have it memorized, yeah. that, you know, have this have this gallery, have this statue that people know, all right, these are the people who, who brought us to the old stadium before. And obviously, it went on deaf years. <laughs> but I think, Fandi right now is 60 years old, he just went, just, just yeah. 60 years old. I really think he should. We should do it before something happens. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Oh, you got a. I got, got a book, man. Just to wow. prove that I, I, I talk the talk and I walk the walk. I've got his new book and his original book. Yeah. You know, I I revere. You know, sometimes I think I revere Singapore icons more than <laughs> Singaporeans do. Yeah. But on, on your point, you know, the statue, for example. It becomes a tourism attraction. Yeah. There's nothing much at the sports hub. When there isn't an event at the sports hub, it feels a bit like a mausoleum. Yeah. It feels a bit like a cemetery. I mean, if they can put a, uh, a artistic statue of the WTA uh, uh, the involvement, women, yeah. the Women's Tennis Association, they did an artistic statue. Why can't they just do one for our true sporting heroes? I think... Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I mean... We're very good, as I say, yeah. at revering uh, political leaders and uh, business leaders. We love those guys, but sports leaders, we don't have many. I mean, there's Fadi Ahmad, there's there's Joseph Schooling and a handful I mean, of I'm, others. There's not that many. I mean, yeah. yes, <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew is a bit modest and he doesn't want that, kind, his, that statue built for him. Yes, that's true. But it doesn't apply for everybody, you know? And also, Some, it's different. It's yeah, different. It's I think different. it's it's more common to build statues outside stadiums for yeah. because the statue is related to the stadium. Yeah, like so the, you build yeah. Alan Shearer outside St James's Park, you know, uh, and so on and so yeah, on. You build yeah. Bobby Moore outside Wembley, mm. and you build Fandi Ahmad outside the Sports Hub. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I'm getting the campaign started right here on this <laughs> podcast. By the end of this season, I want to see it ground dug. Me and we'll be there with the shovels. <laughs> we'll dig it. We'll dig it personally. We'll do the podcast. Day, night, night, and then we'll dig it from out. the Sports yeah, Hub. We will start the campaign right here. Let's get Fandi Ahmad a statue at the now government-controlled <laughs> Sports Hub, Hub. Yeah. and just treat our sporting icons, our football heroes, with the reverence that they deserve. Yeah. All right, we're finished Absolutely. with a legend. Best way to go, finish with a legend. So, <laughs> Ash, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, thank you so much, Neil thank and Hank Young as well. I'm looking yeah. forward to the season, actually, the football season ahead, and of course, more like your books and your writings as well oh, on Yahoo. thank you. Far too kind. You can Far read my kind. columns. This is the shameless plug part. We right. must do the shameless go plug part. Mm -hmm. You can read my columns and my esteemed colleagues' columns uh -huh. in the Yahoo Sports and Football pages. Mine are every Monday. Monday, Tuesday, mm -hmm. and Thursday. Monday and Thursday. Monday, That's Thursday. right. My football columns are out every Monday and Thursday. And this podcast will be out every week at... Yahoo Southeast Asia YouTube channel. And for Facebook, it's Yahoo Singapore, Yahoo Malaysia. Uh, He's got it, man. Yeah, He's yeah, got yeah. it. Now... <laughs> well, thanks for listening to our very far first. Far, 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 far. I make the first mistake at the end. Oh, right at the end. All the right, way through. I make, and I make right the first end. one. Thank you for <laughs> Thank listening you very much. to the first podcast. Tune in again next week at Footballing Weekly at Yahoo. See you next week. Thanks. See you next week. Bye. You.